back in our Father's Word, book of 1 Timothy. Timothy, a young man that Paul has uh, chosen, or God has chosen actually, taught by two women, his grandmother and his mother. Uh, and led into Paul's ministry, and Paul writing this letter is, is basically a doctrinal letter telling you how to operate within a, a gathering of God's people. So having said that, uh, we are on the last chapter of 1 Timothy, chapter 6, verse 1, word of wisdom from our Father, let's go with it. <clears throat> and, and verse 1 reads, Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. In other words, if you're a Christian, always protect your credibility. You draw a day's work pay, you get a day's work out of it. You give a day's work. Even, even if it's a heathen, why? Because don't let the heathen look down on a Christian or think a Christian isn't worth his, his uh, hire. That, that would not go good for God's people. Verse 2, and they that have believing masters, that's even a Christian master, let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather do them service because they are faithful and beloved, partakers of the benefit, that's to say the improved service, these things teach and exhort. In other words, when you work together, you're more profitable. It turns out better, and and uh, certainly that's what brethren do. They help each other, and um, again, it, it's when when um, when you do something, do it better than anyone else if you possibly can. At least strive for it, and you'll always work up, not down. Verse three: If any man teach otherwise, and can, and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness. Th this is the conclusion. You run across somebody, you honor when it's possible, but if somebody's actually teaching otherwise and going against the doctrine of Christ, for he is proud, that means he's puffed up. He's claiming to be something he's not. Try, probably trying to make a name for himself, knowing nothing but doting. This, this means he's a sick puppy. Okay, that's what the word means in the Greek. About questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, even sum, uh, evil summar, summar, summarizing. That, that is to say, uh, a conclusion without evidence. Doesn't go anywhere. Just a bunch of sick words, babble, that uh, prove nothing. This is why you always want to teach God's word chapter by chapter and verse by verse, because God's word is important. Man's word, many times, if you go into a different doctrine, uh uh, it won't fly, friend. It's sick. Verse 5 Perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness, doing it for the money, hey, you make a lot of money, that's godly, okay? From such, withdraw thyself. Uh, um, the, when, when it comes to sharing the word, in the, don't do it for money. Don't, God doesn't send out beggars, okay? Jesus in his teachings made it very clearly, do not take a purse or script. That one of those is a begging bag. Don't go out there and be begging. Okay. But, uh, trust me and the people that are going to take care of you while you're doing God's work. It will happen. And it, that's true even to this day. If you have somebody begging, uh, God didn't send them. Now, I'm not judging. That's just a, a pure fact. Verse 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. It's called a peace of mind. It's called um, self-sufficiency within oneself by looking up and seeing the brighter side by reaching for that high ring, the glory of God, which is to say eternal life. Uh, and uh, that's, that's what it takes. Not, it's not 
is how many people you can share that with. The glory of living forever in his name. Verse 7. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we carry nothing out. And uh, here he quotes Job chapter 1, verse 21. And so it was with old Job. He lost everything he had, his children, his all of his cattle, everything, brought nothing into the world, we're going to take nothing out. That's not really a, a fully true statement. It is true speaking of monies or physical things. Because there is one thing you can take with you, and that's your works. You, you can take your works with you. That's what you're judged by. Documentation on that is Revelation chapter 14, verse 13. Makes that very, very clear that uh, God will do that. Verse 8 to continue. And having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. That, that's all it takes. Don't be over anxious about anything. I know what you need and I'll provide it. That's what God is saying. Verse 9, but they that will be rich, that's to say they have a will to be rich. They're not rich, but they want to be rich. Uh, fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. In other words, the desire for riches can be more dangerous than riches themselves. It, it causes men to take shortcuts and to do many things illegal, one thing and the other, and that's ill-gotten gains. And that's always a debt, a, a debt for you when you have something that's ill-gotten. It's, it's not good. <clears throat> but here, the will to be rich, even that in itself can be very harmful. Verse 10, I mean, I mean, let, let, let's, let's back up just a second. When you serve God and when you serve Him adequately, He blesses you with riches, basically. That's to say, what, everything that you need. You don't have to worry about it. God takes care of His own. And that's the blessings of God, and you never have to apologize for the blessings of God. But ill-gotten gains, that's a different story. Verse 10, for the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. In other words, it's, it's kind of a one-way trip. And uh, you, you, who is it you're supposed to love? Our Father, not money. Uh, if you love money and worship it, you're supposed to worship God. And any time you do otherwise, if you are a worshiper of money, you're in a heap of hurt, friend. Verse 11. But thou, O man of God, flee these things, leave them alone, and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and meekness. That means to be humble before Almighty God. And, and um, this, this builds character. It'll build your character whereby your credibility is excellent. And you're one that is desired to be a helpmate, to help build, to help carry forth a ministry, uh, to do many things. And naturally, this being a doctrinal letter, that's what a lot of this is about. Verse 12. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. That's what's important. Whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. We, know, I know, Timothy, that you want to do what is right. And you, you've confessed this, and you, you have uh, fought that fight to gain eternal life, which is to say to believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ, whom God sent, and gain that eternal life, and, and even more so to provide works to take with you as blessings whereby God can bless you and uh, profit the whole body. That's contentment. That's called peace of mind. And when you have peace of mind, you're not anxious about everything. You love God. God loves you. What more can be said? Verse 13. 
I give thee charge in the sight of God, who quickeneth, that's to say, makes alive all things. And before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession. Well, how, how, did, how did he witness a good confession before Pontius Pilate? Because he hardly opened his mouth. Well, have you ever read the 53rd Psalm? I'm sorry, the 53rd book chapter of Isaiah, where it was forecast long ago that when the, when the son of, of Jesse, the son of David, that is to say Messiah, the beautiful one, when he was delivered up, they would desert him, but he would never open his mouth. He would pay the price. Whereby on that cross, whereby we can have eternal life, where he can quicken you, simply for your believing and your faith in him. He paid the price that he can quicken you, that is to say, give you eternal life. Not just this little life in these flesh bodies, but life eternal in a beautiful, beautiful place. That is to say, even this world, as it is written in Revelation chapter 21. So that's the faith and the good profession and witness that Christ gave before Pontius Pilate. Verse 14, that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable unto the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you teach this word chapter by chapter and verse by verse and be a minister of it to the children of God until Jesus Christ himself returns and, and uh, don't, don't change one jot or one tittle. You keep that word straight, pure, and straightforward, whereby the ears of the children can hear and be lifted and gain and made alive into eternal life because God's word is powerful and it's able to deliver. Verse 15, which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords. At his return, he will do that and he will rule with a rod of iron. He's not coming back as a babe to be crucified. He's coming back to be King of kings and Lord of lords and to put this earth in the proper order that it should be in. And it shall be. Verse 16, who only have hath immortality. I mean, only in him can you find deathlessness. That's what that word means. Dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. <clears throat> that being the message. Don't, don't read over that. What is it saying? No human man. Or let me rephrase it. No man in the flesh has ever seen. Why? Because he's in a different dimension. That's why flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven. That's why it must go back to dust. Because you have a spiritual body that is in that dimension. And can see and will see. If you follow those orders and, and uh, love and faith in Almighty God. That's how precious it is. But uh, you could say, a lot of people in ignorance might think, well, there's nobody could make that. No, in the flesh, you can't see him. Why? Because he is in a different dimension at this time. Verse 17. <clears throat> Charge them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. That is a powerful statement. If you want to know where true joy comes from. In other words, you remind people that might begin to put part of their faith in money. That's not where peace of mind comes from. That's what, that, that, don't, don't be high-minded about it. You, you be humble before Almighty God so that he can still give you richly all things to enjoy. That's to say eternal life and his blessings, his touch, the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life, 
helping you to, to ascertain and to accomplish many, many things. And how precious that is that God, through the Son, <clears throat> provides these things for us. It is absolutely precious. Verse 18, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate. That is to say, be sociable, not high-minded, but to participate in all things, whereby you enjoy the presence of the living God, which is to say, the presence of the very Holy Spirit that leads, guides, and directs, and brings true knowledge whereby you can understand the things of this world, whereby you can understand and know and, and uh, love our Heavenly Father for the many blessings that He prepares for us. Peace of mind. That's a mind whereby when you lay your head on the pillow at night, you can rest. You can sleep knowing, and, unless God is bringing you to a new point. And, and that rest, which always in communicating with God, being sociable with Him uh, more than anyone else, that is to say, in gaining the Word. Because the Word is powerful. Verse 19, Laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, that they may ho lay hope on eternal life. That's the victory. That, that is what it's all about, basically, is to be able to lay hold on eternal life. You know, uh, this life in the flesh is a very short-lived thing. And when it ends, that's, this man is on probation. That's what this earth age is about. It's strictly your choice whether you're going to love our Father or follow Satan. It's, it's strictly 100% your choice. And what you want to do, what does study do for you? It brings you closer to the Father who is the gate and the giver of that eternal life whereby you have peace of mind even in the flesh today to enjoy even this life in bringing forth the ministry. And this, that's what this book is about, is to Timothy. Uh, spiritually adopted by Paul as a minister to bring these truths to the congregation. But don't ever forget who taught him basically the word. It was Lois and Eunice. That was to say his grandmother and his mother, two faithful women in the word of God that, that um, enabled this Hellenist what, well, what is a Hellenist? A Hellenist is a Hebrew that speaks the Greek language. And, uh, and so it is. So uh, that was what Timothy was. And Lois and Eunice both uh, being the same. Hellenist. Verse 20. O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding, and I repeat, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so-called. Um, you know, science is good. Good science is good. Uh, science that opposes God's Word is bad. Why? Because it's incorrect. Science must always align with God's Word, and it does. This earth is millions and billions of years old. That's what science states. That's what God's Word states. God created all things. And good science is a beautiful thing. But naturally, anything that is false, whether it's science, whether it's uh, a, a preacher preaching God's Word, if he's false, it's bad. And babbling, that's what babble gets you. Now, I promised... When we were covering chapter 2 of this great book, and um, when, when I read the 12th verse of that chapter 2, that I would beyond a shadow of a doubt show you and teach you from the manuscripts that 
what is written is that a woman should not uh, speak, but should not babble. And it has, applies to both men and women. And I'm going to do that, because these babblings gets many people in trouble. Babblings are sounds that uh, are not from God's Word, that differ from God's Word, that are the imaginations of people, that is false science, and babblings that can absolutely rob people of eternal life. And, and uh, there's enough of it in the world that you want to steer clear of it. And as I promised, I'm going to show you what the manuscripts say. I, I realize that the King James, sometimes there's, they, they, in the original 1611 uh, translation, there is a letter from the translators to the reader. And they tell you to be very careful. They did the best they thought. And when a man is translating, he, he's going to translate his thoughts. And many Greek words and Aramaic words and Hebrew words have more than, have multi meanings. And naturally, if you're a transcriber or later translator is farming in his own opinion which word to use, never let it rob you of the privilege of being able to decide that for yourself by having the proper tools whereby you can identify babbling from the true word of God. And uh, no more need be said about it than that. For in God's word, there are many things. And it is up to you where you have access to manuscripts to double check things and see what is true. Okay, let's go one more verse and then I'm going to do that for you. I'm going to document from God's word. Verse 21, which some professing have erred concerning the faith, grace be with thee, amen. There's a lot of people have erred by not recognizing babblings or false teaching from the true word, true divine word of God. I'm, I'm going to take you to a place in um, the 14th chapter of 1 Corinthians. You're not going to have it. I'm going to take you in a moment to the manuscripts, though. But I, I want to read these two verses for you uh, concerning women. It would seem that some men like to give men a bad taste. The Aramaic and even the Greek will tell you this applies to both men and women. So how is it... Uh, but when, when it comes against women, I cannot stand for that. When it's incorrect, when it is a bad translation, I'm going to call it to your attention, whereby you can know that God loves uh, everyone. There is a reason God has said in, in Acts chapter 2, as well as the great book of Joel chapter 2, in the end times, I'm going to use both sons and daughters. They're going to prophesy and preach teach and bring forth the word of the Holy Spirit. So how could it be uh, for a woman to uh, pray and prophesy? It's written in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 that a woman should always have Christ over her head, not hair, Christ over her head when she prays or prophesies, which is to say teaches. So how can we have women teaching in chapter 11 in, in Acts chapter 2, in Joel chapter 2, and then have false translations. Let's get into it, if we may. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 34. Let your women keep silent in churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience as also Say, saith the law. Where does the law say that? Verse 35. We are all to be obedient. You understand? To Almighty God. Verse 35. If they will learn anything, let them ask their husband at home, for it is a shame for a woman to speak in the church. Now, this word speak, as it is utilized here, um, 
It's, it's not the word speak as the Strong's Concordance brings it forth. The word means to babble. Don't let a woman babble or a man either in church. Because babble, vain babblings, will take you nothing but deep trouble. Now, I'm going to take you in the, um, in the manuscripts to this word speak in chapter uh, 14, verse 34. I'm, it is not permitted unto them to speak. I want you to know what that word speak is in the Greek, and we're going to go to it on, on the monitor way up here at the top. I want to go to the manuscripts, okay? To them to speak. And here is the Greek word. I'm going to speak English so that it doesn't confuse anyone. L-A-L-E-I-N. I know that looks like a V, but it's nun. Nun in the Greek uh, alphabet. I'm going to spell it again. L-A-L-E-I-N. Now, um, which is lelin. And remember, remember the final spelling of this. E-I-N. That's very important. Now this is from the British Museum, the best set of, of New Testament manuscripts that can be afforded today. So let no one take that away from you. Now here is what Strong's converted this letter. But do you know what this 2980 is? I'm going to show you. Here it is right here. It's L-A-L-E-O, and that's Lelio, which is related, and related words like the Latin Lelis, if I may have that, the nurse's croning, and, and uh, Fowler, back in, in uh, to lull to sleep, a lot of preachers can do that, but this is still not the word. The German is Leilen, and the English is to lull, and naturally this is where we get our word lullaby. It just sings them to sleep. But what is the main thing? Zero in on that word right there. It means to prattle. And, and Strong's did pretty good on that. But here is our word that is actually in the manuscripts. Laline. What does Laline mean? Among many other things, as animal noises, gurgling, it means to babble, and it has no other meaning. So what it's saying is don't let your women or men babble in church because it documents and proves nothing. Now, I'm going down to a really blowed up uh, copy here. So this is what Strong's will give you. It is incorrect, very incorrect. It will kind of get the job to, done to bring you to prattle. And prattle it is. But here is the actual word that is in the manuscripts, which has only one translation. L-A-L-E-I-N. I guess I will give it to you in the Greek. Land, Alpha, Land, Epsilon, Iota, and Nun. Um, and that, this cannot be changed. And it means that with one meaning as well as with a few renditions of many other things, to even talk like an ape, but to babble. And I'm sorry, but babble is what it says, and, and that is your absolute proof from the very manuscripts themselves of, of what the word means and what it should say, that women should not babble, but men shouldn't either. I will never allow anyone to babble or gurgle, make ape noises, or anything else while God's Word is being taught. So I know that, um, again, many times we had um, Deborah who was a judge and a leader. God used her to lead all of Israel. Huldah was a university professor of God's Word where they went to her for understandings. And um, there, there are many women of the Bible that have done exceeding things. And God uses both men and women. It is a shame that through the years that many have in ignorance and not doing their homework from the manuscripts 
have allowed this to befall women. It would keep silent. Not keep, don't babble. Don't prattle. And don't make animal sounds while God's word is being taught. Don't make any kind of off sound. It's disturbing and certainly takes away from God's word. But that applies to both men and women. To a good teacher is just not going to tolerate it. So there you have it. Absolute proof from the manuscripts where Laline is utilized that a woman should not do. Not Lelio. Lelio, lull you to sleep, not... I mean, that'll work, but it's not what the manuscripts say. The manuscripts say babble or ape sounds. Don't let anybody make those sounds in church or any other way. I promised you I would do this for you. And this, this um, reading that I have given you comes from Kettle's uh, Volume 4. You'll find it on page 76. And it is a good translation and a good uh, meaning. And God will love you when you study His Word in depth whereby you're not falsely judging people or instructing people with bad information. God, through the Holy Spirit, uses whomever He will. All right, and there we have First Timothy, Second Timothy tomorrow. Stand by. God bless. Listen a moment. Won't you please?